and I think I'd like as it's now 530 I can sort of finish with stuff. So this session is about direct school physical realism. It's a follow-on session from the first session that we had on basic physical realism. I thought it might be useful to offer you a response that Roy gave during one of his uh, one of his reading group sessions. And it's to do with the way in which you access critical realism. Don't let yourself get overwhelmed by it. Roy Sotama paraphrasing what he said, he suggested that the best way of dealing with dialectical critical realism is just to listen to it and return back to it. It's not to become overwhelmed by it. Take from it what you want. Understand that little bit of what you want and then come back to the next bit. The, the work that I do with the coaching work uses dialectical critical realism in its, uh, in its idea of, of freedom, and particularly an idea of the freedom, uh, creativity, love, and right action, which is the way in which I take my sense of understanding of dialectical critical realism. So I really suggest that you allow yourself just to hear what Ray has to say and give yourself that moment to just to enjoy what he has to say. I can see that he's there, and I'm just going to ask to make sure that Roy's got his talk switched on. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, brilliant. I can hear him all there. So, um, thank you, Roy. And I'm, oh, that's great. Oh, there he is. Great, Roy. And thank you for being here, Roy. Yeah. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. And, uh, uh, welcome to this second uh, session to everyone who's um, tuned in. And um, this, as I think Ari said, will be on dialectical critical realism. And now you'll remember that um, dialectical critical realism is the second of the three main phases of critical realism. The first phase, which we discussed last time, uh, basic critical realism consists of transcendental realism as a philosophy of science, critical naturalism as a philosophy of social science, and the theory of explanatory critique as a sort of proto-ethics. And then we have dialectical critical realism, and uh, next time I'll be looking at the third phase, which is the philosophy of meta-reality. Now, um, the best way to see these three phases together is to see them as exercises in ontology. As developing the arguments uh, that we advanced last time. Uh, so, uh, you remember when we um, uh, began basic critical realism, uh, we saw that it had begun uh, with a double argument about ontology, an argument for ontology and against its reduction to epistemology, and uh, an argument against the implicit ontology of uh, the dominant uh, traditions in Western philosophy. Uh, this implicit ontology uh, we saw was actually uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, was of a kind uh, uh, which would have uh, made science uh, effectively either useless or, or impossible. Um, so, um, what we're doing now is developing our ontology um, this week and next week uh, to take in uh, uh, a deeper and more specified account of being. Uh, what we got from basic critical realism uh, was, uh, you might say, an idea of being such and an exploration of being as involving non-identity. Um, and two particular forms of non-identity uh, came very much to the fore, differentiation and stratification. So that was the main thrust of um, the ontology we developed last time. Uh, but actually, of course, uh, we need and we need philosophically 
to know much more about the world than that it's differentiated, say, between open and closed systems, and stratified, say, between generative mechanisms and structures on the one hand, and events on the other, uh, all between the domains of the real and the actual. Uh, and um, but this deepening of ontology is what uh, dialects of critical realism and the philosophy of meta reality uh, uh, achieves. So, um, uh, what I'm going to do now is just list the seven uh, levels of ontology uh, that we'll be exploring all together. Um, the first level uh, is a level which thinks or understands being as such and being as non identity. And that's called 1A. The second level, 2E, explores being as process, being as involving negativity, change, and absence. The third level uh, explores being as together, as internally related, and as a whole. The fourth level uh, understands uh, being as incorporating transformative practices. So those are the four levels of dialectical crystal realism. And then uh, next week we'll be discussing the three further levels of the philosophy of mental reality. And uh, the fifth level, 5A, understands being as uh, inward, uh, as uh, reflexive, and as uh, generally interior. The sixth level, uh, called 6R, understands being as re-enchantment. The seventh level uh, <coughs> understands being as incorporating the primacy of identity over difference and unity over split. And in particular, understands being as non-duality. So the, the four levels of dialectical physical realism that I'll be concentrating on <coughs> today. And um, the uh, uh, basic critical realism has said a little bit about the first level, 1M, and uh, a little bit about the fourth level, uh, 4D. The philosophy of science has talked about uh, structure and, and difference uh, at one end, and um, the philosophy of social science of critical realism has uh, talked about such the concepts of uh, transformative agency and uh, structure and so on. So we've already got some uh, components of dialectical critical realism there. <coughs> However, dialectical critical realism, uh, which I suppose was initiated uh, with the publication of my book, um, dialectic Accounts of Freedom in 1993, and then later, etc., uh, a year later. Um, uh, I should probably say, not initiated, but um, explicit philosophy, dialectic critical realism, uh, was uh, initiated by those um, uh, publications. It is uh, a systematic deepening of all those four levels. And um, what I want to do uh, is go in this first uh, hour through uh, the main features of those uh, four levels. So um, I'll just uh, 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 repeat the uh, four levels for you. Um, one end, uh, understand being the such and being as non-identity. So this is um, uh, starting off um, from where basic critical realism uh, starts off, but is uh, deeper as we think. Uh, then theory uh, involves being as a uh, process, as incorporating change and negativity. 3L involves being as internally related, and as a whole. And 4D uh, 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 synthesizes being as 
incorporating uh, transformative uh, practice. Um, so um, let's start with one end. Uh, almost all uh, the distinctions of uh, almost all the um, developments uh, reported in uh, basic critical realism involve relations of non-identity. And that's why it's a key feature uh, of 1M. So we say that the transitive and, and the intransitive dimensions are distinct. That uh, ontology is something which isn't the same as epistemology. It can't be reduced to it. Uh, the domain of the real, uh, talking about causal laws and fields and structures uh, can't be reduced to, i.e. isn't the same as uh, patterns of events. Um, patterns of events aren't the same as uh, our experiences. So we have the differences between the domains of the real, the actual and the empirical. <coughs> um, uh, <coughs> But in um, the corpus of uh, dialectical and critical realism, uh, uh, we move on quite a bit uh, um, uh, further. Two very general points uh, about ontology uh, need to be uh, noted. The first, that ontology is explicitly thematized as all-inclusive. So ontology includes not. It includes epistemology, but it includes also uh, uh, error and illusion. Um, an illusion can uh, have a causal effect. And we say that in general, anything that has a causal effect uh, or causal power uh, is real. Uh, um, so ontology will include clues. Uh, uh, um, Mathematical mistakes, uh, for instance. Um, uh, ontology is uh, 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 all inclusive. And then ontology is also inexorable uh, because there's no way you can't do uh, ontology. If you give an account of knowledge or an account of language, then you are implicitly giving an account of the world known in knowledge or spoken about in the language. So you can't help but do uh, ontology. <clears throat> then uh, we specify um, uh, particular uh, objects, topics, that um, need a realist uh, uh, analysis. So we have dispositional realism. This is the idea that Possibilities are real, not just actualities. Um, so, um, <clears throat> if we have uh, an actuality, something that happens, then the possibility uh, it actualizes or realizes must also be real. And in general, uh, that possibility uh, it sits along with a possibility of different things. So um, the idea that another world uh, is possible, or a better world, uh, or the idea that um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we can uh, consciously move towards it, all these are things which are situated uh, by uh, dispositional realism, which becomes very important. Um, uh, in what they call concrete utopianism. Then another form of realism, uh, all, all of these realisms are implied by and necessary for the dialectical development, the full development of transcendental realism. Another form of realism is categorical realism, which is the idea that uh, the categories the objects that uh, philosophers have liked to talk about, uh, like causality, law, uh, 
they themselves are real. Uh, they're not as Kant and Popper, uh, for instance, would have them, subjective impositions that um, we put on the world. Rather, they're in reality itself. So the world contains not only lots of different causal or laws, it contains causality, law, etc., as such. A very important um, extension of uh, realism here comes in the theory of meaning. And the crucial concept here is the semiotic triangle. The semiotic triangle uh, is uh, a triangle uh, with uh, its three apexes uh, uh, constituted by the signifier. Uh, which is the word or um, uh, uh, symbol, uh, the signified, which is the meaning um, or concept, and thirdly, uh, the reference, which is the object to which the uh, signifier refers. Um, typically, in Saussurian and post Saussurian uh, uh, semiotics, uh, analysis of meaning and language, the reference is dropped. So we just have a relationship between uh, the, uh, we just have a relationship between uh, the signifier and the signifier. In fact, it can be a very complex relationship of the sort that uh, someone like Derrida uh, will analyze, but there is no reference uh, there. Um, and without a reference, uh, the whole point of language, uh, which is to enable us uh, to more coherently steer our way around the world, uh, is, is lost. Uh, I, I should just add that the Anglo uh, 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 Saxon uh, and the American uh, tradition in uh, linguistics has often made uh, the opposite mistake of assuming a simple relationship uh, between uh, signifier and reference. So that the signifier, the concept, the meaning, uh, uh, gets lost. We need to uh, clearly uh, uh, situate language in a world, a world which exists uh, in large part independently of the uses of that language. And uh, so situated in the context of uh, the semiotic triangle and uh, a world in which uh, language has, uh, uh, in which things have become referentially detached uh, from the language we use to uh, describe it. So that's the important concept of referential um, uh, detachment. And then uh, we have here um, an elitic uh, realism, a, a realism about truth. And VCR argues that um, uh, 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 philosophers have um, uh, had a too simple uh, concept of truth. And um, actually what is involved in the concept of truth are four distinct components. And the first, I'll just run through these components. The first component could be called the fiduciary component. This is the sense uh, of um, uh, true, uh, uh, which is involved when you say um, uh, this is true, and you mean trust me, take my word for it. This is true as a social bond. Then there is secondly, uh, the um, uh, uh, warrantedly certainable, evidential uh, sense of truth. Uh, this is a sense in which we say that something is true when we have sufficient uh, evidence to assert it in a scientific context. So, and that, of course, is the concept of truth that most philosophers have concentrated on. But then, thirdly, there's a very interesting sense or concept of truth, uh, which I call 
the expressive referential. Um, this is the sense in which uh, the graph is green, perfectly expresses the greenness of graphs. And we can understand that graph is green as straddling the ontic epistemic divide. And then the fourth sense of truth uh, is a genuinely fully ontological sense of truth, in which I might want to say something like, um, the truth of the fact that uh, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade lies in its uh, molecular constitution. Um, in other words, there I'm saying the truth of what happens at one level of reality it is the structure that produces it at um, a higher order of reality. And um, ontological stratification and elective truth um, sit um, side by side. Another uh, important um, uh, uh, concept which has given a, uh, a realist interpretation in uh, BCR is that of a Tina formation. A Tina formation uh, occurs when a falsity in theory is combined with a truth in practice. And the sort of thing I'm thinking of here, for example, could be illustrated by the way in which chemists and physicists uh, observe in practice a distinction between open and closed systems. They do not regard the open system as well as falsifying their uh, experimentally generated uh, results. Uh, at the same time, they feel that they can use uh, the results of um, expect careful experimental work to uh, make statements about how the world is going on transactually, quite independently of the closure or otherwise of the systems. Uh, and you wouldn't be a chemist, you wouldn't be a physicist unless you observe that distinction in practice. But of course, and for many chemists, uh, that will sit very uneasily with the empirical realist, perhaps empiricist, positivist theory they adopt. And so there'll be this, this uneasy compromise, compromise formation in which they carry on successfully doing the right thing, but can't think uh, why it is the right thing. So that you have this theory practice and inconsistency. And the team of formation is the typical mechanism uh, in which the uh, illusions and ideological errors under which we live is reproduced. Um, then, finally, um, I want to um, point to a basic logic which is uh, uh, brought out clearly, can be brought out clearly here at uh, 1M. And this is the logic of emancipatory distance. Because when you say um, um, that um, you want to be free um, um, in um, a um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, what you are, um, I'll just uh, rephrase that. Um, it may not be you who says it, maybe when the theory um, is articulating uh, uh, the possibilities of our freedom, what it will be often typically doing is positing a basic level of a human being, which is okay. Um, uh, uh, which sustains uh, another level, uh, which has become emergent from it, which is acting as a constraint. So you might have um, human uh, capacity to labor uh, being constrained in uh, Marxist theory 
by the existence of uh, class relations. And the argument is that at a certain point, the capacities to labor uh, will um, break free, throw off um, the uh, level which is um, imagined and um, sitting on it and bettering uh, those uh, basic human uh, productive forces. So that's a very familiar pattern. Uh, there's a level of human being uh, and activity which is all right, uh, which is productive, uh, which contributes to human happiness. And then there's another level um, uh, which is um, bettering it. And this other level uh, is, is, is emergent from uh, the more basic level. And what is required is for it to be shared. What is required is an act of disemergence. And there's an ontological asymmetry here because the argument of the person committed to the logic of emancipatory discourse would be that. Uh, we can't have a society in which human beings don't create and not productive, but we can have a society without exploitative class relations or uh, whatever. So those are the, some of the developments uh, under uh, 1F. Now, at um, 2E, um, uh, which is the, uh, probably within uh, dialectical critical resistance, um, and this is the, uh, the most important of um, the um, uh, level, and um, it's the, the level which um, requires a new uh, or a, 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 a considerably developed uh, philosophical system. So um, let's focus on the concept of change. When uh, you say that something changes, what you're saying is that something which was there has passed out of existence, and some and or something that wasn't there has come into being. <coughs> in either case, uh, you're involved with uh, negativity and with uh, absence, with the uh, disappearance of what was, or the appearance uh, from what wasn't uh, of uh, something new. So um, this is our normal everyday understanding of uh, change. Um, and this uh, uh, was pronounced uh, by Parmenides in ancient Greek times as being absolutely wrong. He said, in effect, you cannot have change in the real world. And this is, of course, it's a striking uh, doctrine uh, because it seems obvious that uh, there appears to be change. Now, his uh, uh, doctrine uh, of what I call ontological monovalence, prohibiting ontological change, has proved profoundly important. And ontological monovalence, together with the epistemic fallacy and uh, actualism, uh, are uh, the three uh, unholy errors of Western uh, philosophy. Um, how, uh, uh, if, if, if Parmenides had just left it at that, of course, uh, and uh, uh, no one had uh, uh, followed up, uh, it might have been regarded as um, uh, a one of the typically philosophical uh, statements. Um, uh, and it's to, due to Plato uh, that um, this uh, Parmenidian idea uh, uh, became uh, received doctrine. Uh, uh, and what uh, Plato did was he analyzed 
uh, apparent change uh, in terms of difference. Uh, and uh, I, in a substantive scientific way, uh, this was supported uh, by an idea that what happened when something seemed to change was not really change, but just a redistribution of unchanging parts. So these unchanging parts might be forms in Plato, or they might be atoms in uh, atomism. Now, this idea that you can um, understand change uh, along the lines of difference, of course, denies um, the difference between saying that um, uh, Sophie's hair color um, on Tuesday is uh, different uh, from Sophie's hair color today, and saying that Sophie dyed her hair. Sophie changed the color of her hair, or the color of her hair changed. Because what's involved in the uh, 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 talking about change is the idea of uh, an underlying continuum, a substance which remains unchanged, um, uh, which underwent um, the transformation. And this may not be uh, uh, simply a substance, it can be a region of space or time. Um, uh, uh, so that um, uh, one can say that um, uh, the, the difference between saying that in this cafe we have um, Sartre and uh, we don't have uh, Pierre and saying that in this cafe, Sartre uh, greeted the arrival of Pierre uh, is understood in terms of a change in the space, namely the arrival of Pierre. <clears throat> so, um, uh, the um, analysis of uh, change that um, DCR puts forward is um, consistent um, with our ordinary uh, concept change and involves a view um, in which uh, 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 the cosmos um, uh, in which we see emergence or the production of uh, uh, big new things as uh, being uh, a uh, vital feature. Now, um, how, how would you convince yourself uh, that the DCR analysis um, was right? Well, uh, uh, one way of doing it is to um, think about uh, ontological change and epistemological change, uh, and then you might, then you can see there's a difference between uh, me saying uh, that it uh, started to rain um, in uh, uh, in Manchester, uh, which is about Manchester, and my saying, uh, Jack, uh, uh, believes that it rains in uh, uh, Manchester, or it is correct to say um, that it is raining in Manchester. Um, in one case, the um, the absenting, uh, the negation is in the world itself, and in the other case, it's in our uh, descriptions of the world. And for DCR, uh, we can have change, and we, uh, we do have change at both levels. And of course, unless epistemic change was also ontological change, uh, we wouldn't have language, belief, uh, and uh, knowledge in the world itself as properties of the world. <clears throat> so, um, for uh, DCR, absence is uh, a key concept. And uh, what DCR brings, puts um, 
to which is the center of our attention, is uh, the idea of determinate uh, absolutely. So it's not concerned with nothingness, uh, indeterminate absence. It's concerned th with things like um, the absence of rain or um, uh, um, uh, 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 some uh, uh, concrete instance of uh, 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 something uh, not happening, uh, which has a causal uh, uh, effect, and uh, which we need to uh, take account of uh, in our understanding um, of uh, reality. So now I want to say a little bit um, about um, a two-e notion, uh, uh, which um, uh, and many are very mystified about, namely the idea of uh, dialectic. And um, I can do it, um, I, I can start it uh, rather, uh, uh, best by um, going back to um, Marx's uh, uh, famous uh, reception of Hegel's uh, dialectic. Um, uh, you remember that he wrote um, to um, Engels um, that Hegel had discovered the secret of all, uh, 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 the secret of all uh, 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 knowledge, the scientific method, in his uh, elucidation of, um, uh, in his dialectic. Um, and um, uh, he, he marked to Engels that if only he had a few, uh, a bit more time, uh, he'd like nothing better than to write uh, a couple of printer's sheets uh, explaining what this uh, secret of the scientific method was. Well, uh, it's very unfortunate he didn't do this. And uh, many other people um, since then have tried to explain uh, what they consider the secret of um, uh, dialectic is. Um, there was a, um, one um, <coughs> gentleman in the 19th century who wrote a book called The Secret of Hegel. And after three or four hundred pages, uh, one could say the reader would be no wiser as to what this was. Well, actually, uh, I think that dialectic is a complex concept, and there are many difficult, different kinds of dialectics, which in uh, DCR I try, I try and uh, uh, diffract, separate down, and uh, reconstruct. But um, it's quite clear uh, that there's one kind of uh, dialectic, uh, which is the one which excited uh, uh, Marx. Um, and um, I think um, DCR can give a very uh, simple and plausible explanation of this. Uh, so let's um, uh, go back to um, science. And, um, you remember Kuhn's description of science uh, in terms of normal science, in which the um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, 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 scientist who is a neophyte who is being trained is uh, tested, and uh, uh, then. Um, uh, revolutionary science in which uh, concepts uh, are being radically transformed. So um, I think it's possible to give a very simple dialectical critical realist reconstruction of the um, uh, different phases of science. So um, um, any uh, theory uh, will try and describe all the causally relevant uh, factors uh, or um, 
uh, impinging on uh, the result that is described. Uh, now, uh, very often, and in fact, we would say pretty much always going to be the case, that the scientists will not uh, uh, succeed in doing that. So that um, although the attempt has been made uh, to uh, describe a whole field, something causally relevant uh, uh, has been left out. And sooner or later, the causally relevant thing which has been left out will extract its toll on the theory. The incompleteness uh, will generate inconsistencies and contradictions, which will appear to the theorists as a signaling device that they've left something out. And, uh, of course, what they've left out very often in science is something they didn't know about. And so, uh, what this uh, 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 situation of uh, tremendous contradiction uh, at yields, a pre-revolutionary situation, revolutionary situation, in which uh, con a new concept uh, has to be there to uh, restore um, uh, scientific uh, equilibrium. And from a realist uh, standpoint, a method standpoint, that means that something new has to be discovered about the world. That you have to discover what it is that you've left out. And of course, in Newton's case, it was gravity. Um, in, uh, when Einstein was formulating special theory of uh, relativity, it was um, uh, 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 that, that was what he uh, discovered. And uh, um, after the discovery, then consistency in the conceptual field can be restored. Thus, there is a simple way of describing a dialectic of scientific knowledge in which um, an absence or an incompleteness in uh, the theory uh, generates, leads to uh, contradictions. Uh, and other aporia or problems which proliferate, necessitating uh, a, uh, a, 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 the, the discovery of what it is that's been left out, and uh, that is uh, a scientific breakthrough or a scientific uh, revolution. So, um, this is a very um, simple. Uh, and a uh, plausible uh, process that occurs in science. Uh, could we say something uh, more general uh, uh, might occur in society? Well, um, in the couple of decades uh, before the First World War in the 19th century, uh, we had uh, the phenomenon of the suffragette movement. Um, and what was the suffragette movement about? It was about a huge incompleteness, absence in uh, the um, uh, political field uh, that women could not vote. Um, and uh, in the course of um, the, uh, those decades, and the decade or so after it, um, women in the Western world, at least, were granted um, the suffrage. Um, so that uh, what had happened is um, the uh, political totality has been transformed to be a more inclusive one. The absence has been uh, remedied or rectified. Uh, <clears throat> then, of course, um, there was a problem for many countries in uh, the Western world, in the uh, 20s and 30s, um, and uh, particularly the colonial powers in, in, in Europe, um, that um, they uh, were the masters of um, colonial peoples who were denied uh, 
their own uh, uh, democratic rights and denied um, the right to be uh, self-determining in respect of their own countries. Um, again, you can see how this necessitated a response to uh, this, this challenge and of course all the pressures um, that it brought uh, uh, to bear, that were brought to bear on uh, the political setup in um, those uh, powers uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, 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 until you had uh, a state of uh, decolonization. Um, and then of course the argument can be taken further. You can argue, was this decolonization real or purely formal? And then you can um, take the argument into the field of democracy. And we can say, okay, we have the vote, but uh, how responsive uh, are our uh, political leaders to our needs and wants and uh, our best interests? And wouldn't there be a way uh, of um, improving uh, the democracy uh, we had? Um, and so the argument um, uh, continues. <coughs> what's, um, uh, what's, what's important to note here is that there is a clear um, uh, mechanism uh, uh, in a, uh, such a dialectical process, a clear learning mechanism in which um, our um, uh, uh, response uh, to a social situation or problem field moves in a negentropic way, that uh, moves to uh, increasing order. And that uh, negentropy um, is um, uh, brought out and has its origin uh, perhaps in uh, um, Hegel's, um, or it's, it's not perhaps origin, but it's uh, is, is very well stated in um, uh, the Bible by Hegel. Uh, um, and we can now make sense of the um, uh, Marxist uh, metaphor of the rational kernel and the mystical shell. Um, and say the rational kernel of a dialectic, at least that kind of epistemological learning dialectic, is um, the remedy uh, of incompleteness or absence um, uh, by building um, greater, more inclusive, more comprehensive uh, totality <coughs> of theoretical or, or social. Um, um, there's quite a lot more that could be said about um, dialectic, but um, I'm beginning to run a uh, uh, short of time, um, so I, I won't say it here. I hope only that you've got an, had enough uh, to whet your appetite um, to read it in uh, the DCL text. But there's another Turi concept. Uh, that's very important to note. Um, and that is, in two we, we uh, theorize uh, in a critical realist way space, time, and text. And in particular, uh, a useful concept is that of a rhythmic, which is a, a, a spatio-temporalizing causal process. And um, what is um, uh, interconnected by this concept is the uh, tri-unity and irreducibility of uh, geography, history, and uh, social theory. Um, the concept of uh, the past and the future are also uh, given uh, deeper uh, reading. Well, if you just look around the room you're in, um, you'll note um, where the furniture comes from and uh, when uh, roughly the uh, house or uh, building that you're in uh, was 
uh, constructed. Uh, and then you'll think about what you're talking about, and you're talking about philosophical ideas, uh, which were not, have been long handed down, like uh, actualism, like ontological monotheism. And you can, we can say that to a large extent, we are living in the presence of the past. I have not so much time uh, for 3L and um, 4D. Um, 3L is um, very important. It's um, uh, the level in which we explore uh, not taking things extensively, not regarding things as atomistic and on their own, but as together, that what I'm saying now has to be taken with what I said last week and your questions. And this particular sentence has to be related to the sentence before it. So they can't be taken alone. Uh, they don't make sense alone. So if you think about relations in a family, um, then you get a good sense of um, uh, what that means by internal relations. Some uh, social relations, and a, a lot of natural relations, are external. Uh, the difference to this cup of tea, um, this cup of tea does not make any difference to uh, what's inside that uh, bottle of water. So, that is an external relation, uh, but um, my um, sitting here uh, and talking to you is internally related um, to your interests and, um, uh, and, 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 and presence. <clears throat> so the idea of an internal relation is um, the our arch idea in uh, 3L. And uh, clearly, uh, we can move from taking things together to taking things as a whole, as a totality. And in the social world, most uh, totalities are partial totalities. That's the totality shot through by external relations as well as internal uh, relations. Um, the concept of holistic causality uh, is tremendously important, and um, we'll all uh, be aware of this intuitively. Uh, it's the idea of a um, set of uh, uh, component parts, uh, all of which uh, um, interact so as to produce a whole, and a whole which in turn uh, uh, produces uh, as an effect on the component parts. So that you, you have uh, a complex um, of um, uh, continuing the interaction between parts and parts, parts and whole, and whole and parts. A very important concept uh, at 3L is that of a concrete universal. Now, uh, most of the universals that Western philosophy talks about are abstract universals. And um, um, the idea here is that um, uh, what you can say meaningfully and scientifically uh, about something, you should be able to say about all instances of that thing. So what I can say about a pen, uh, at a scientific or meaningful level, I should be able to say about all men. Now, of course, uh, that breaks down uh, uh, in the real world, and I, I don't know of a single abstract uh, universal. If you take something which is universal, uh, like a human being, um, you'll find that the human beings are all very different. So uh, it, 
each human being will have what we call mediations. Uh, these are specified. It's about sex or gender, uh, it's occupation, uh, or whether it's a, 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 whether it's a, a, a parent, children, uh, brother, sister, uh, uh, whether it's a fan of uh, uh, the Rolling Stones, or, or whatever. Um, those are its uh, mediations. Then supposing we now focusing on two uh, women who have exactly the same mediations, then uh, they, these two women will themselves differ by having a different space-time path. One will be 35 and born in Gala, the other will be 70 and born in Timbuktu. So that is the um, uh, 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 geohistorical, specific geohistorical trajectory of um, the particular instruments of the universe. And I suppose we had two women who um, had exactly the same mediations and exactly the same geohistorical trajectory, they would nevertheless still be irreducibly different. They would have an irreducible uniqueness to them. They would be what we call concrete singularities. So the theory of con the concrete universe of concrete singular um, is um, an important way in which um, um, dialectical and critical realism makes it possible to identify real historical, pure historical individuals and talk about them. Uh, uh, finally, um, I should note here uh, the um, useful uh, concept of a constellation. Uh, we can think of, you know, I said earlier that um, and knowledge um, is also part of being. So we can think of epistemology and knowledge as being contained or overreached by being. And at the same time, the uh, knowledge will always have a specific intransitive object. That is, a specific part of being will be what the knowledge is about. So, um, in this way, through this uh, kind of um, uh, um, uh, figure of constellational overreaching and containment, we can do justice to um, the sense in which ontology or being includes everything, um, um, uh, including epistemology and knowledge, and the sense in which knowledge and epistemology have specific and uh, intransitive objects. Uh, very briefly on uh, 4D. Uh, DCR uh, uh, starts off by noticing the irreducibility of agency. There is no way you can not if you decide not to act, that is itself a form of action. But when you think about it, there's no way you, you cannot intend. Uh, intentionality is irreducible. And then, uh, if you think about it, spontaneity or uh, an immediate uh, manifestation of thought in action is uh, irreducible. At a certain point, uh, thought uh, becomes action, uh, uh, must be an element of spontaneity, or as I'll talk about next time, non duality, for agency to be possible at all. Um, we saw last time how uh, the concept of um, uh, 
how I lost and how the transformational model of social activity, which specifies the relations between structure and agency, needs to be expanded to um, uh, uh, the concept of full plane of social being. And this is the idea that everything that occurs in society <coughs> and social world occurs, occurs simultaneously at four different levels. The level of material transactions in nature, the level of social interactions between people, the level of social structure, and the level of the stratification of the embodied personality. <coughs> now, one of the problems that um, uh, the left in particular has to face uh, is that projects to so oriented to social change have in general only been uh, directed to a transformation in social structure. Uh, whereas to change uh, uh, our social life, to change society, we need to operate on all four levels. Uh, by the same token, it is said that um, uh, the right uh, uh, generally uh, has uh, restricted itself to um, or tendencies within it to um, self improvement, uh, to uh, uh, improving uh, the um, at, at the level, improvement of the level of the stratification of the embodied personality. Of course, we need action on all these fronts um, for genuine um, social change um, to occur. Uh, now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there and um, I'll uh, round this exposition of DCR off uh, with um, some brief remarks after the break on ethics, DCR ethics, and um, the DCR uh, efficacy of um, uh, Western philosophy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Roy. I, I